Get your Bibles turned to Ephesians 6 and Exodus 25. You're going to want to probably put a marker in each. We're going to go to each quite a bit. Ephesians 6 and Exodus 25. If I can find Ephesians. When's the last time anybody in this room had a blowout in their car and had to change their car tire? Had a blowout while driving their car and had to, on the spot, change their tire. I mean, is it recently? Quite a few times? I know a guy, in the past year, it's happened twice to him. In the same car. Is it white? Yes, it's a white car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it currently has a donut. Yep. Yeah. I don't think that car will be here next week. <laughs> They'll say he's going to settle that problem with a new car purchase this week. <laughs> I just can't imagine. That is, that is crazy. At least. Still happened again last night with new tires. I I know the problem. Michelle is four wheeling in that car when you're at work. She rides in the shoulder where all that nails and screws are and says, "Watch this." <laughs> all right, we're in a really really good study, um, but it generated a lot of conversation last week, and you know that's really good. To get us thinking um, about some issues. That's, that's, that's what this is all about. Um, so we're on the second piece of armor discussed in Ephesians chapter 6. Let's just read Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 before we go any further. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 says, Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We spent two or three Sundays talking about your loins girt about with truth. We kind of gave that uh, a title of the belt of truth, if that's okay. The word belt is not in the text, uh, and I understand that, but try to get a picture of what that's about. What, what is also interesting is we're going to go to Exodus 25 and 28 and look at the first several times that the word breastplate is used in the King James Version Bible. Um, and what we're going to find is some similarities. It even talk, and not only does it talk about the breastplate, but it talks about the loins of that high priest. Um, and I th- find that interesting with it being right there in the same uh, text that we're discussing. But we talked about, so we, we finished the, the, the loins girt about with truth. Last week, we started the breastplate of righteousness. And in a quick, quick recap, and I'll just remember, I'll just remind you right now, you all got out early, 10 minutes early last week. So keep that in mind today. Um, The breastplate for that Roman soldier. What were the areas that that breastplate protected on that soldier? It It was the two major vital organs. I think it's an organ. Heart and lungs. Heart and lungs. What happens... If your A, heart, or B, lungs get pierced in war, you, you, yeah, you, you, you die. That video is rolling, correct? Okay. Um, There's some other things I wanted to say, but I won't right now. So it protects the, the heart and the lungs. There was an incident that happened this past week here in Illinois that was unfortunate that I wanted to discuss, but I won't. Um... So when you read this text, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. And when you go to research this topic of breastplate of righteousness, it's pretty much split down the middle 50-50 of the men that teach what that righteousness is when you're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. About half will teach that that righteousness there is imputed righteousness, that Jesus Christ, he imputes his righteousness to you the minute and second that you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And they, they say that's the kind of righteousness that is used in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, when it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. 
The other 50% say, no, the kind of righteousness that it's talking about there is practical righteousness. That is, after you're saved, we should do what? We should produce good works. And it's our righteous living, our living by the word of God on a day-to-day basis, practically speaking. And the reason they say that it's practical is because they think in the text, when the text says having on the breastplate of righteousness, by contrast, you should probably would be able to take it off. And if it's imputed righteousness, obviously you cannot take off God's imputed righteousness because once you're saved, you're always saved. That camp would say, since it says having on, it has to be practical. The first camp with imputed says, since it has the, word, the terms having on, it must be imputed because God put it on one time and you keep it on and you have it on. So you can see how the terminology, just from, a, uh, from an educational standpoint, you could say it's this one or it's that one. So what is it? That's what we're trying to determine. So I hope you kind of understand the difference there and and why that's important. And it is important because they're different. So the imputed, that's God declaring us righteous. He justifies us, reconciles us, sees us in Christ. And we're supernaturally baptized into the body of Christ by God the Holy Spirit. Or practical righteousness being a morality issue, putting off sin, putting on the life of Christ. In kindness and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, the righteous life talked about in Ephesians chapter 4. So, we had a lot of discussion last week. There was a bunch of us that said it could be imputed. There were several of us that said it could be practical. And there was one of us that said, why not both? Why couldn't it be both in the text? But this can be a little confusing. Uh, confusing. I want to make sure I don't miss anything that I wanted to say. If it's imputed, if it's imputed righteousness, that would have to be a one time Christ imputed it to you, never to be taken off by God or us, because that's the way imputed righteousness works. If it's practical, that's a choice that we make to live righteousness, righteously. And there are days where you live righteously, and there are days that we do not, isn't it? There are most days that we walk, and we don't walk the way God sees us, do we? Why is that, by the way? Because we still have sin. We're going to look at a verse and how sometimes this verse gets twisted. But if you're saved and God has imputed his righteousness to you, it doesn't mean that he has changed out your heart to where you can't sin. It means the way he sees you is perfect, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. So that when Christ looks down at you, he looks through the completed cross work of Christ and sees perfect, sinless righteousness. So... Here's the main thing I want to point out before we even get started. In the text, we cover the first piece of armor. We're covering breastplate of righteousness now. What does each of these six pieces of armor equip the believer to do in the text? Let's read um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Why purpose or intent? that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So whatever kind of righteousness this is with the breastplate of righteousness, it's going to equip you and I to stand against the tricks and the wiles that the devil is going to throw our way. Is Christ's imputed righteousness going to assist us in that endeavor? Or is our good works going to assist us in protecting us from the tricks and the wiles of the devil? But whichever one it is, that's going to be the purpose, right? So I just want to make sure we get that straight before we go on. And a reminder that the breastplate protects the vital organs of that soldier. This is not a a physical 
picture here, I understand that in Ephesians chapter 6. This is talking about the, the spiritual life of the believer and what's going to protect that believer from these tricks and wiles of the devil. The breastplate protects the vital organs. The word breastplate occurs 28 times in 24 verses in your King James Version Bible. In 25 of those times, out of the full 28 times that the word breastplate is used, 28 times, I'm sorry, 25 of those times, the word breastplate is used in reference to a piece of armor clothing that the high priest had to wear in relation to the nation of Israel when he acted on their behalf. And that's where we want to go to Exodus chapter 25. So if you've got your Bible, we'll turn to Exodus chapter 25. We quickly read through these last week. What we, what we understood is that this word breastplate, the first time it's used is Exodus chapter 25, verse 7, where it says, Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. He's describing a piece of clothing for the high priest. He talks about um, the tabernacle and all the details and the, and the furniture and the dimensions of that. He talks about the ark and all the details and, and, the, and the dimensions that goes with that. Then he goes back to talking about the tabernacle again. Jump over to um, three chapters later, Exodus chapter 28. I think this is where we're going to find some interesting details. I also want to say a quick word of warning that when God's talking here in Exodus chapter 28 about this high priest wearing this breastplate, this isn't just something that's cute for him to wear in to the Holy of Holies. This is an absolute necessity for the high priest to wear in. And it has two functions in the text, and we'll get there. One, it protects the, the heart of the high priest that goes into the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies. The second purpose that it does is it acts on behalf of the people of Israel that temporarily covers their sin and how often does that have to be done? Every single year, the text says continually. Very interesting. So Acts chapter 28, verse 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. You know, sometimes when people see priests, they think of the modern day term priest and what a priest does today. Can I say to you that that's not what it is? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things you can say about that, but it has nothing to do with what a priest does today in the dispensation of grace. The priest at this time was absolutely required to act on the behalf of the nation of Israel. Verse 2, And thou shalt make, a, make holy garments... Is this just garments to make them look pretty and spiritual and let everybody know, hey, I'm a priest, you can't do and say certain things to me because I've got this white collar on? Matter of fact, in the text, you know what, you know what the piece of, only piece of clothing you're not going to see in relation to how we currently think of a priest? I don't read one word in here that says a white collar. Not one word. For whatever it's worth. But verse 2. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. So he's, he's doing two things here. He's setting up, he's identifying who's going to be the holy priest in the, in the texts. Okay? He establishes that Aaron and his sons are going to be the high priest. And in doing so, he's going to give them specific clothing to wear. Verse 3. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him. Now understand, again, currently what we're reading, what, is this, what are these holy garments, who are they going to be for? It's going to be for the priest. To make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in what office, in what, in what way is he going to be performing? going to be performing in the office of the priest. So verse 1 says it's in the priest's office. Verse 2, it's holy garments. Verse 3, 
I'm sorry, verse 2 again, it talks about the holy garments, Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. In verse 4, again, it mentions the priest's office. I'm sorry, verse 3, it mentions the priest's office. Goodness. Verse 4. And these are the garments which they shall make. Number one. What's the first one? A breastplate. And an ephod. And a robe. And a broidered coat. A miter. And a girdle. Isn't that interesting? The very first two things, or well, first two of the first things, is a breastplate and a girdle. When we were studying out, your loins gird about with truth. Gird about with truth. The same kind of an, of, of an issue here. And a girdle. And they shall make holy garments. These are garments that have specific function for the priest in the eyes of God. Holy. Holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So when they go into that tabernacle to minister to Israel, they're supposed to wear this breastplate, first piece of armor. Verse 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment. Now, when we're going through this, you're going to need to tap into everything you know about time past, but now, and ages to come, and the, and, the, and the information you know about the nation of Israel, and the information you know about the body of Christ. You're going to have to re- put, put all this stuff into context. So, for this Jew over here, boy, I wish another color wrote. I didn't want to make it the same color. Okay, red works. So, for this Jew over here, and that high priest, what is their breastplate going to be? Just said it. It's going to be a breastplate of judgment. What is our breastplate called over in Ephesians chapter 6? A breastplate of righteousness. Right away, that should get some, some wheels spinning and thinking. Verse 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twin. So he goes through all of these details. I have to stick to my notes on these or I'll get off track and I won't get through what I want to get through. In your mind and what you know about the Word of God, is there a difference between judgment and righteousness? Let's just real quick spell it out. When God dealt with the nation of Israel, what manner did he come at them with? Judgment. They were always doing what they shouldn't do, and he would come in and do what? The blessings and the curses and that judgment. When he deals with you, what does he deal with you on the basis of? Peace. When you, when you think of time past but now, it's judgment and war. And over here in the dispensation of grace, it's grace and peace. Now that should, that should speak something to us. Verse 16. Four square it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof and a span shall be the breadth thereof. I mean, it goes through the actual length and the width of this thing. Now we're going to look at some details. Verse 17, And thou shalt set in it settings of stones. There's going to be four rows of these stones. One, two, three, four. Four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. Now, we just said that it was four rows, but what did it mention about each row? There's going to be three in each row. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. How many is that total? Total is 12. Verse 18. 
And the second row should be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, uh, a ligur, and an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall set in gold in these enclosings. Uh, verse 21. Why 12? And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12. According to their names, like the engravings of a signet, every one with the name shall be according to the 12 tribes. So here's what we know thus far. That high priest has on necessary and required holy garments, the first of which is a breastplate. In this breastplate, woven into it, are going to be 12 uh, stones each one representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. So as a high priest ministers in that office, God tells him, this is what you're going to be required to wear. Jump down to verse 29. <clears throat> And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment. Upon whose heart? It's, a, it's, it's on the high priest's heart. He's going to bear these 12 tribes of Israel on his own heart because he's got the breastplate on covering his heart, right? Verse 29, and uh, we're in Exodus chapter 28, verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord. How often? Continually. So whatever happens with this breastplate, it has to happen continually. Continually. From the text, we know this is talking about the Holy of Holies from, from your understanding and our pre-knowledge about this information. How often does that high priest go into the Holy of Holies on behalf of the nation of Israel? Once a year. Yearly. Are we together so far? It says the high priest must bear the names of the children of Israel. It happens continually. It happens yearly. Every year he goes in that holy and holies. On the, what's that day called every year that he does that? Do you remember? The day of the day of atonement. The day of atonement. And evidently, that high priest will go there continually until or if something changes, right? It just tells them to do it continually. Remember also that high priest with that breastplate, I'm sorry, that Roman soldier, the breastplate, what did it protect? In this situation thus far, what does it protect for that high priest? His heart. Why would that be significant? When that high priest goes into the very presence of God, what does he have to have taken care of? Your heart conditions, your sinful heart's got to be taken care of before you enter the, the presence of God, right? The high priest can't just walk into the Holy of Holies like you and I and say, hey God, I need these guys' of sins you know, covered again for a year. Why not? He has his own sinful heart that he can't enter the presence of God. Hold your finger here. Don't go, don't leave here. Go over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. This study to me is just fascinating. When you think of the details that God has to take care of in dealing with these issues, it's, it's mind-bending to me. I can't find, I don't think my book's got, I don't think my Bible's got Hebrews in it, for sake of Peter. Mark 10, 
By the way, for those of you that have trouble focusing on smaller print, I mean, this is free. You don't have to pay for this. But have you seen the commercial where the husband and wife go in to order a meal at a restaurant? And they're trying to see their menu. They can't see it. She tells the waiter, I'm sorry, we can't see. We forgot our readers. We can't, we can't see the words. He says, no problem. He grabs her, her, her menu and off he goes. And they're sitting there going, what do we do now? Well, he comes dragging out these big, humongous menus about the size of the front of this pulpit and hands him each one of these menus. It's just gigantic. But I thought of that when I was trying to find the book of Hebrews. I, can't, I couldn't see for a second. It's the lighting, obviously. I remember. <laughs> I can't read my birth date. I don't know how. <laughs> oh, goodness. The joy of aging, right? You guys don't know nothing about that. Okay. So that blood, that, that, so when that high priest goes in, obviously, from your previous studies, what does he actually do when he goes in to, for that day of atonement? What, 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 what covers that, their sin, based on what the high priest is doing? He, he has, what does, he, what does he put out for them, for, for the nation of Israel to cover their sin? He sprinkles some blood, right? Sprinkles blood. So the blood that a high priest sprinkles on the top of that mercy seat every year, does that take away all their sin? No, it's temporary, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually... See the exact wording? The blood of those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually cannot make the comers thereunto perfect. Now when Jesus Christ imputes his righteousness to you, and he sees you through the cross of Christ, does he see you as perfect? Yes. yes, he does. This blood back here wasn't possible to make them perfect. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. If the blood, the one-time blood, after the priest did it one time, if it had the power to make them perfect, then they wouldn't have to come back continually and keep doing it, would they? Do you know why you and I don't have to keep going back to God to beg and plead for forgiveness of sins every time we go to church? Because it is a one-time deal done. Amen. Taken away, forgiven, out of the way as far as the east is from the west. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Every year when they sprinkled that blood one time, what did that do to the nation of Israel? It reminded them that they're a sinner and they need God's temporary covering. Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So this blood over here was temporary. We're done with Hebrews. You can go back to Exodus chapter 28. Okay, we're actually okay on time. For now. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 28. So we read verse 29. Let's read it again. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel. Who's Aaron? He's a high priest. Talking about this breastplate shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment 
upon his heart when he goeth into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Verse 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. I think I jumped ahead of myself when I started talking about the heart condition. But here it is. They shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord. How often? Continually. Aren't you glad that you are not in the state where your sin has to continually be taken care of over and over and over? The breastplate here, folks, is not associated with complete righteousness. It is not associated with declared once for all righteousness. It's very temporary. And if that doesn't happen again next year, in this text back here, if that high priest doesn't go again next year and sprinkle that blood and someone dies... What happens to that individual? Die in their sins. So that high priest bears on his heart the sins of that nation of Israel with the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. What's on the inner side of that breastplate, though? So you got all this stuff on the outside of the breastplate. What's inside of that breastplate? It's the heart of that high priest, that sinful heart of the high priest on the other side of it. On the inner part of that breastplate is the heart of the high priest. It looks as if the high priest must have on this breastplate to enter the presence of God. So you're holding your finger there again. You should have already had a spot in Ephesians 6. Go back to Ephesians 6. Why do you think it might have been called the breastplate of judgment back there in the Old Testament with with that priest and that nation of Israel? Why would it have been called the breastplate of judgment? Yeah, they had to be aware to be judged and get that sin forgiven. What did Israel have coming? They had some dead judgment coming. This isn't in the notes, but when you stand... If you're a believer, and I know everybody in here, and I know that we're all believers, and we understand that our sins have been totally forgiven based on our faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the completed work. Therefore, when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, what is he going to declare you? Completely righteous. Did that happen year after year with this Jew here in the Old Testament? No. It was temporary. So Ephesians 6.14, just to read it, to make sure we have it in our frame of reference. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So when you look at this chart, from the time that nation of Israel is formed, all the way through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, up into the time that Jesus Christ died on the cross, Up until the time that the mystery information is revealed, it's all judgment and temporarily forbearing or covering the sin of that Jew. All the way through here. When you get to the, to the cross of Christ, and Jesus Christ completes the work that's necessary to satisfy the judgment of God, and God calls out Paul 
and forms the body of Christ, of which you and I are a part of. That judgment, that breastplate of judgment, then becomes the breastplate of righteousness. Because it's not until that perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross that he is able to declare you righteous. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I think we've read this every single time we've had this message. And it bears repeating because there's a whole lot of things we've got to have to get in our frame of reference to, get, to hopefully get this down. And I'll just say this. Just because we're going to look at this and try to define whether it's imputed or practical, if you disagree, that's perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay. No one's going to be upset. So we're to have on that breastplate of righteousness because our sin has been settled. Justice has been satisfied. That word righteousness, that word is used 64 times in 57 verses in your King James Version Bible. And Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 tells us to put on that breastplate of righteousness to stand against who? You stand against the devil for what purposes? To overcome his wiles and his tricks. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted through the simplicity in Christ. You know, we've taught this verse several times over the past year looking at this issue, and just this past week I kind of thought of another issue there. It says, but I fear lest by, what's those next two words? What means or what avenues will Satan use to try to confuse and complicate and ruin your Christian faith? He will use any means necessary. Lest by any means, his, his, his mode of preference is to do it extremely slowly and subtly to where you think, ah, that's not a big deal. That leads to the next, ah, that's not a big deal. And before you know it, you don't have a completed word of God because it can't be preserved over the ages. Because men aren't, aren't, aren't capable of that. You've got to be careful. When the winds of doctrine start blowing, and Satan's wiles get put into motion to deceive you and to trick you and to make the simple things complicated. Now, is placing your faith in the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ complicated? No, it's simple. But people get caught up in, but how can God do that? How can, how can that do satisfy his justice? That's not for us to determine. When you get into all of the intricate details of how, and that's not possible, Satan loves it. Satan loves it. There's a word I'm trying to think of. Well, that's frustrating. But he will do anything to move you off of your stand of who you are in Christ. If you're already saved, his primary goal is to move you off of your stand as to who you are in Christ. Do you need something more? Do we believe in once saved, always saved? How many times you got that question? So you mean to tell me that once you're saved, you can go out and commit murder. God's going to welcome you into the gates of heaven and say, come on in, murderer. You ever notice that when you have this conversation with people, they go directly from saved to murder? No in between. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't go cheating on... Murder, killing somebody. 
But, but, do you know what the answer to that question is? Yes. Well, that's not possible. Well, you've got to take that up with God. But the simplicity in this verse, where is the simplicity? This is important. But I fear lest by any means the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? Where are you placed when you are taken out of Adam and you trust in the, in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? You're put, taken out of Adam and put where? That's simple. But you know what Satan's going to get you to try to believe? You're not in Christ. Because you didn't do X, Y, and Z. Look at the sin that's in your life. You can't possibly be saved. Because the verse says, once he saves you, he saved you of all of your past sins, and you still got to work on getting your, pre- your future sins taken care of. Because isn't that what the verse says? Forgiven you of sins that are past through the forbearance of God? Satan will use verses to corrupt your minds from the simplicity that is in Christ. Does the verse say, forgiving you of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God? Yeah, it sure does. Romans chapter 3. We'll get to that. You're in 2 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Where are you placed once you're saved? One of the things he makes unto us when he places us in Christ is he imputes his very own perfect sinless perfection righteousness to you. You're placed in Christ and Christ is placed in you. You now become Christ. Now, I don't mean that in the sense that you live that way. But when God sees you, he sees you as as perfect and as sinless as Jesus Christ himself. Because that's where you're placed and he in you. Second Corinthians 5.21. You probably all know this one by heart. That's a great verse to know by heart, by the way. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Jesus Christ had no sin to his account. That we may be made the righteousness of God where? In him. When we trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he takes us out of Adam and places us into Christ... His righteousness becomes our righteousness. The righteousness of God, the fact that he never sinned, Christ is your righteousness. And we're made the righteousness of God. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. And if, you're in, if you die in Adam, never having your sin issue taken care of, guess what? You're a dead man. You're a bust hell wide open. What was the issue there with that high priest when he went before the presence of God? What did he need taken care of? His own heart. He couldn't appear in the presence of God in his own sin. Or else he would be in the same position that you and I would be if we weren't saved. The breastplate of judgment has been replaced with the breastplate of righteousness. Turn to Romans chapter 3. I told you we were going to cover this issue. There may be people on a video that's thinking, well, he just said that you're only saved of your sins from the past. Is he going to deal with that? Or? <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, that should be highlighted in as many highlight colors as you have. That may be the most significant part of this passage. But now, where are we at in time history? 
We went through all the Old Testament. The Jews, the Jesus Christ died on the cross. He called out the Apostle Paul, and he names that time period where he calls out the Apostle Paul and explains what the cross accomplished. He calls that the dispensation of grace, or the but now period. Not until that time, but now, in that time of history, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. When that high priest went, to, went into the Holy of Holies on a yearly basis, what, what was he operating under? He's operating under the law. Time passed. The righteousness of God without the law now is manifested. Something has changed, has it not? being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. And if your Bible says something different on this next word, you need to get a new Bible. Amen. The righteousness of God is by the faith of Jesus Christ. And it's unto all and upon all them that believe. The faith in that verse is not yours or I's. That's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to come to this earth when he did with the sole purpose of going to that cross and dying and shedding his blood, thereby completing the whole purpose that God had set up since before the foundation of the world. And Jesus Christ's faithfulness to do that and complete that, the fact that he was the only one qualified as my kinsman redeemer, he was the only one that led a perfect, unsinful life, and, all, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. Three things that nobody else in all of recorded history or in any recorded future will ever be able to qualify with. And his faithfulness to go to that cross on this earth and die and pay for the sins of the world. And it's available to everybody, the verse says. Upon all them, there's just one issue and one thing that's on the human being responsible to do to obtain this righteousness. And what is that one thing? Upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And I tell you again, even after you're saved, guess what you're still going to do? You're still going to sin because you still have your flesh. And where does sin reside? Besides in your flesh. Those that teach that once you're saved, you're never going to sin again, would have to teach that they no longer have flesh. And that's ludicrous. You're not, going to have, you're not going to shake sin until you get rid of your flesh. Verse 24, being justified freely. Was that Jew freely saved? No, it was an act yearly, year after year. Being justified freely by his grace, it's only in one place. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the finished work of cross. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, and here it is, folks, to uh, through propitiation through faith in his blood. Because people always say, well, you always talk about faith, 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 faith to be saved. Faith in what? Faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. The only completed work that's necessary and allowed. To declare, why, why do we have to have faith in his blood? To declare whose righteousness? His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. <clears throat> See, I told you, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he only paid for your past sins. That verse says it. Does that verse say, died for sins that are past? Sure does. Remember when we read over there in Hebrews chapter 10 and it talked about the blood of the bulls and goats? And it said, waiting until that perfect sacrifice comes. Talks about that. That perfect sacrifice is Lord Jesus Christ. What happened to these folks over here with the breastplate of judgment where they had to have their sins dealt with continually year after year on a temporary basis they had their sins temporarily covered by the blood of those bulls and goats. Hebrews says it couldn't have taken the, the, the sins away. The blood of the bulls and goats can't take that sin away. 
but it temporarily covered them until, and the Lord forbeared their sins. Verse 25, through the forbearance of God. He forbeared their sins with a picture of that blood that Jesus Christ was yet to come and shed. And he forbeared it year after year until the perfect sacrifice comes and dies on the cross in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's far different than what you and I have today in salvation and dispensation of grace. We've got it all front-loaded. Once you and I believe, we have all blessings in Christ in heavenly places. We have total forgiveness of sins. We're supernaturally baptized in the body of Christ and made a member of the body of Christ. Our sins totally dealt with, forgiven for all times, past, present, and future. Did that Old Testament Jew have that? No. All of their forgiveness was 100% based on that future sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. Ours, when we get it, we have it all up front in dispensation of grace. One time. One time. Just say this is the body of Christ. We have something called the breastplate of righteousness. Continually, yearly back here, we have it one time forever. They had temporary, we have permanent forgiveness of sins. That's ENT, isn't it? I need to take a class on writing and talking at the same time because I cannot spell. We have on the breastplate of what in Ephesians chapter 6? Righteousness. Our righteousness is forever and complete and our sin is remitted and taken away once we trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looks at you and he declares in his justice righteousness. And he takes his own righteousness and his own sinlessness and imputes it to you and declares you righteous. Jesus Christ then becomes our righteousness. Turn to Hebrews 9. And we'll be done. You say, praise the Lord. You know what's just, to me, you know what's so amazing to me? We're looking, we're studying the armor of God. Six pieces of armor that he assigns to us in in Ephesians chapter 6. We didn't start covering the first piece of armor until just over a year into the series. Now we're in the pieces of armor. We spent three hours looking at the loins girt about with truth. Today will have been two hours that we've covered the breastplate of righteousness. And we have another message in the the next one that will be about the breastplate of righteousness as well. Three hours for each piece. Sometimes we just glare over these verses and we just let it go. But there's some detail and just each one of these pieces has got an immense amount of detail. When God says the breastplate of righteousness, he covers hundreds of hours of study that you have to know to understand what this is talking about, maybe. Maybe. Where did I say to turn? Hebrews 9. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered, entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now in the end of the world hath he appeared 
to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What finally forever took away sin? The blood of Jesus Christ was the first and only thing that completely takes away, is that the terminology it uses? That totally puts away sin. That's why that Old Testament Jew couldn't have total forgiveness of sins with their sin totally taken away. Totally put away. Not until Jesus Christ himself comes and makes that sacrifice. Remember when we looked at girding up the loins I can't remember the verse now. <laughs> Ephesians. You don't have to go there. 6.14 says, Standing therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Remember when we looked at that and we tried to define that. John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, the life. What did we determine at that girding up your loins of the truth? What is the truth there in that text? It's Jesus Christ. When Paul talks about our righteousness, Christ's righteousness is never separated from the believer. The way I see that. He is our righteousness. He is in us, and we are in him. And the two can't be separated. So in case you missed it, I believe that the breastplate of righteousness is the imputed righteousness of God. Because it can't be separated from the believer, first of all. Second of all, if you're going to be tricked by the wiles of Satan, are you going to trust your moral, righteous lifestyle to avoid the wiles of the devil? or already having on God's imputed righteousness say, I am complete in Christ, Satan, get back. Yes, my sins were all dealt with, Satan. You can't touch me. So in case you missed it, I think it's the imputed righteousness of God. But do you see a pattern? Who is your truth in the text? Belt of truth? It's Jesus Christ. Who is your breastplate of righteousness? Jesus Christ. Because the two can't be separated. When he tells us there in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God, I think in a nutshell he's telling you, when you wake up every day, you need to remind yourself... You are complete in Christ. Nobody can take away your salvation. You can't out your salvation. You can't do good works to help earn your salvation. You can't do good works to help stay saved. And when all that stuff starts coming and he's trying to complicate the simplicity that's in Christ, what do you do? You hide in the Word of God where it says, I'm complete in Christ. You take cover in the Word of God that says, you are holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. You clothe yourself with that breastplate and say, God has saved me once, forever, and I have His righteousness imputed to me. That's why nobody or no thing can touch you, because it's not yours anyway. Whose is it? It's Christ's sinless righteousness imputed to you. That is the best defense against any wile of the devil, by the way. It doesn't matter where he's coming from or what he's trying to trick you in. If you know those things from this book, you're protected. And that's why we always talk about the daily searching and studying of the Word of God. And you want that Word of God to go where? Where do you want this Word to be? Inside of your heart. 
And that breastplate of righteousness protects what? The vital organ of the heart. Amen. That word needs to be built up in us and the truth in our righteousness, and our daily intake of it, and when it's daily intook, that will produce something in your daily life, won't it? When you walk knowing positively you are the righteousness of God, that will affect how the, how the decisions you make and the interactions you have and the responses that you give to people. Because it's made to generate peace and contentment, and happiness, and thankfulness. And have you ever tried to be mean as a rattlesnake while knowing that you have peace and contentment and forgiveness and eternal security? It's hard to do. Matter of fact, I don't think it's possible. And put that on one time and you have forever protection from the tricks of Satan. I gave you 10 minutes last week. I took exactly 10 minutes today, so we are even Stephen. Any comments? The uh, past sins, forgiven. Explain that simply. For that Jew in times past, talking about, you're talking about Romans chapter 3. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Good question. In times past, which is what the times past is talking about in the text, and that Jew got their sins temporarily covered, not forgiven, temporarily covered. Then when Jesus Christ comes on to the cross thousands of years later and dies, he can look through the eyes of the cross and go back here to times past when they were temporarily covered and say, on that basis, that's what I forgive them. That's how I forgave them temporarily. That's how I covered their sin temporarily, looking through the eyes of the cross way back here to when that priest would temporarily cover their sin at the Holy of Holies. Does that make sense? And he... Not referring to our sin. Not referring... Yes, good point. That's, that, that verse there has nothing to do with the sins of the believer today in the dispensation of grace. It's talking about the sins of that times past Jew and that he temporarily forgave those sins until the perfect sacrifice came, and then he could wipe out our sins totally and theirs because of the cross. That's right. They're just covered right now. Yeah, I'm glad we clarified that, especially for the video. Any other comments? Does that all make sense? The breastplate of righteousness and that being God's imputed righteousness? You know, never, never in Paul's epistles are we instructed to place... That's the right word. Any protecting value on our life. Well, we can't count on ourselves and our good works for much of anything, can we? Because we have sin in our life and we're going to mess that whole thing up every day, some point or another. So the idea of it being practical righteousness, just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. That's, it was in my notes. I didn't go there. Galatians 3.8 says, And the scripture... Foreseeing that God would just that's not the verse I had. Foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Yeah. So when God saw that temporary blood on the mercy seat there every year, he temporarily forgave that, looking to knowing that 
the perfect sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ was coming. Now, yeah. but there was another scripture I had similar to that in here that I just I just didn't go to. I didn't have time. Anything else? All right. Let's pray we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word. Lord, we're just thankful that in this present evil world, we have some kind of protection to seek peace and contentment and protection from this awful evil world. I pray that as we go through the days that we will, we will just rest in what you said, that we are totally forgiven and seen and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight and understand and, and place value on the fact that none of our works can save us. It's your completed work that does the sealing, the saving and the sealing. We're thankful for that. We're thankful that we have a place physically that we can come to and encourage one another and look into your word to try to figure out how to live in this present evil world. Lord, we're most thankful for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that came and gave his life, a perfect, sinless life, murdered at the cross so that we can have total forgiveness of sins. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for your word that you've preserved that we can read it in. In your name we pray. Amen.